now we're going to talk about angels. I have a little testimony from when I was a child. I don't know. I must have been every bit of five or six years old. I don't know. Maybe a little older, seven or eight, but I wasn't much older than that. And I remember <clears throat> looking up into the sky and seeing what you see in front of you right now. Wings, a shake and of wings. And I remember just staring at it and going, wow. And I remember telling my mom <laughs> and she said, well, how do you know it was an angel? And I, again, I'm all of probably six, seven years old. I said, how do you know when you've seen God? My whole family's my fellow. I didn't know. I just know at the time I believed I'd seen an angel. But let's keep it moving. So we have been talking about ways that God speaks to us. Angels are another way that God speaks to us. They're not only assigned to speak to us, but that is part of what they do. So we're going to explore more of what angels do. Amen. So first of all, I'm going to answer who are they and what do they do? So let's look at Genesis 3.24. We're going to look at some samples of who they are and what they do. Genesis 3.24. Let me say in the onset, I'm sure that there will be things that you could discover later. You said, well, Reverend Lady didn't talk about that because there's so much material in the Bible about angels. I doubt that I'll get to every single verse, but I'll do my best to give it as I can practically do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, somebody needs to be muted. I can't see who it is, so. Um, but everyone, please mute yourself. Uh, okay. Genesis 324, let me put my spectacles on. Genesis 324 says, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and the famous sword was turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So this is when God created Adam and Eve in the beginning. And then he gave them directions of what they should and shouldn't do and what they shouldn't eat and so forth. And you remember they saying they disobeyed. Because of their disobedience, he pronounced certain judgments upon them. One of the things he did was drive them out of the Garden of Eden. And he set cherubim as guards, if you will, at the gate to keep them out so they could never go back in again. And so when you look at the scripture, you'll, we're going to see a multiple multiplicity, I should say, of ways in which God uses angels. And one of them, uh, in this instance, they are called cherubim. Uh, uh, one angel would be a cherub, and cherubim would be the plural, plural. Um, they are winged beings, celestial beings, often used to attend or guard the things that God has determined for them to attend to and guard over. And we see that in a number of scriptures. Um, these aren't the only angels, but these are the main, I think, when you think of angels as a plural and a big group, typically you're looking at cherubim. Look at Exodus chapter 25. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. When, when God gave Moses the directions of how to build the Ark of the Covenant, he gave them very specific directions, how to overlay it with gold and all of that. And then if you look at verse number 18, and you shall make two cherubim of gold of habit work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. And so if you ever see a picture of the mercy seat, you'll see their wings are spread out covering the mercy seat. Those would be cherubim. Typically, uh, again, set as guardians to oversee and to watch over. In verse 19, make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherub then at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And then if you look in Exodus 37, <coughs> Look at verse 7. 
He made two children of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. So this is just the essence of when he obeyed the directive that God had given to him. Okay. We see other instances. Numbers chapter number seven. If nobody else is excited, I know at least Gina is. <laughs> She's been excited all week. And Dr. A. Verse number 89 says, now when Moses went into the tabernacle meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat. That was the ark of test testimony from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to him. So this was, again, just a reiteration of what God had told Moses to build when he built the ark and the mercy seat. Okay. Look at Psalm 99 and 1. Thank God spoke to him that verse was saying from that place. It represented the presence of God. This was before the tabernacle was built. And he built that as the representation of his presence. Okay, 99 and 1. <clears throat> the Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. That that mercy seat, if you will, that represented the presence. Some of y'all remember the movie, the, the Lost Ark, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was representing the Ark of the Covenant, which represented, again, kind of the presence of God for the people of God at that time. Okay, that's Psalm 99 and 1. 1 Samuel 4 and 4. Samuel 4 and 4. The people sent to Shiloh that they might bring there from the, there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. Again, the Ark represented the presence of God. So when God allowed the, uh, the, the um, Ark got stolen at one point and, and of course, it brought all kinds of plague upon the people who took it. And um, here, the people are saying, we need to go back and get the ark. All right. Then 2 Samuel 6. I got killed for touching it. And David arose and went with, went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called the name of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So again, same principle, same presence of God represented by that ark and, and the um, cherubim that rested upon it or were built again to be upon it. Okay. Look at First Chronicles 13 and 6. Thirteen and six. Let's see. Yeah. And this is really reiterating. One of the things when you do a little deeper, deeper study and look at the ark and then this presentation or its representation of the presence of God. It had to be handled a certain way. So when it was brought up, it was brought up incorrectly. And when it went to slip off of the, the uh, uh, carriage, let it look, lack of a better word, that it was being carried on, it ended up uh, being that it was slipping. And so somebody grabbed it to keep it from hitting the ground and they died. And then David was scared to touch it. So it sat in the Philistines territory for a while. Um, and I don't want to get off on that tangent, but the point I'm trying to make is it represented God's presence uh, everywhere that it went. And the cherubim rested upon it because that's the way God had it. And they are like guardians. Okay. Second Kings 19 and 15. Let's see. Let's 
It says, I'm going to start from verse 14. And Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers. I read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and stood before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kings of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. And this is again where the ark represented the presence of God, the cherubim guarding over that presence. Hezekiah went before with his prayer. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that he laid the, the letter he had received threatening him and the people of God before God and began to pray. That's a whole other teaching. But sometimes we get information. I remember when we had a prayer uh, war room and I told the ladies, bring all your documents, everything you got from the court, bring it and lay it before God. And, and of course, we saw all kinds of miracles take place. We saw people with life sentences reversed. We saw people go home years earlier than they had expected because we laid it before God and we petitioned him. But that represented God's presence when he laid that before the Lord. Isaiah 37 and 16. Hard to hear me. Let's see if my volume's all the way up. Yep, my volume's all the way up. <clears throat> Might be my voice. Let me try to project a little better. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Isaiah 37 and 16 says, Oh, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, there it is again, the one who dwells between the cherubim. So you see this constant reference to God's presence and the, and the role that the cherubim played in guarding over it. I believe Psalm 82 and 991 again. Read it away. Yes, so I'm not even going to go look at those, but you can make note of those as well. Now, <clears throat> Genesis 19 and 1. When we talk about who they are and what they do, I'm going to start looking at different scriptures and show you examples of their function. Genesis 19 and 1. Some of you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. When God decided to destroy it because of the wickedness of the people who lived there. It was his angels that he sent to do it. When you read the chapter 19 of, of Genesis, it says, verse one, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Sodom. And then it goes on to talk about how the men of the city were perverse. They came to try to have sex with the angels and, uh, Lot, of course, you know, has been criticized over the centuries because he took his two virgin daughters and said, here, have sex with them instead. But uh, the angels intervened and said no. And he, they snatched Lot into the house. And eventually they told Lot and his whole family, get out of town because we're about to destroy. We're about to set it off up in here, up in here. <laughs> But he said, we're about to destroy this city. So they sent Lot and his family out. And you know the story of his wife. They told him, don't look back. And she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. But the point is, God gave them charge of us to protect us, to keep us. And we're going to see that in scripture. But you also see they, they are called to carry out God's will in the earth realm. So here God had determined to uh, destroy Sodom. How did he do it? He sent his angels to take care of that. Uh, when you look in Exodus, and I'll pull it up, uh, we'll look at it further, but uh, when, they, when the uh, Passover occurred, what did God do? He sent a death angel. The people of God were covered by the blood because they were told to put blood on a lamppost. But it was the death angel that came through to carry out God's will to kill all the firstborn. So their role, we'll see as we continue, is not only 
to protect us, but to also execute God's will. Uh, look at Genesis 32 and 1. Uh, this is when uh, you may recall uh, Jacob and, and his brother Esau, and Jacob uh, had stolen Esau's birthright. And so he ran away because he thought <coughs> Jacob thought he was going to get killed by Esau, which he probably would have. Uh, so he ran away. Look at verse one of chapter 32 of Genesis. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw that, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanani. So they, uh, again, play different functions. Primarily, they are given two key uh, functions. That is to watch over the people of God and to do what God has ordained to be done in the earth. And in this instance, I, Jacob was chosen of God. Of course, we know him as the father of the, uh, the uh, 12 who became the, the pillars of the faith, so to speak. And um, the tribes came out of him as their sons, his sons uh, were the heads of those tribes. So God had his angels in place in Jacob's life. And he encountered them as he went along the way. And we're going to see in scripture, sometimes we may be encountering angels and don't even know it. Uh, I wanted to make sure I mentioned while I am going along the way, I put this in just to remind myself, you know, you can add your questions and prayer requests to the chat as we go through our lesson each week. Uh, we love getting your prayer requests. We pray over them. Uh, I know I have individually, I know other individuals have, and then we even got together as a team and prayed over you all and your prayer requests. So we want you to know that we definitely are concerned about what's concerning you. And if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. That way, when I finish, we can go through them. Um, and as I said, wherever you're chiming in from, you know, put it in the chat and then remember to tell us how many are with you. Okay. Look at Joshua chapter number five. I love this story because in the uh, text, it's talking about the fact that Joshua was called by God to take over after the Israelites had come out of a bondage in Egypt. Uh, Moses had led them out, of course, but Moses died. And God called Joshua to pick up the mantle and to carry them and lead them into the promised land. But he had, they had to fight. Uh, the enemy tried to hinder them from inheriting what God had for them. That's a whole nother teacher right there. But the key thing is he was called to lead them. But look at Joshua chapter five and verse 14. It says, I'm going to start at verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or, are, or for our adversaries? Look at what, verse 14. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to earth and worship and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your son off your feet, foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, why is that one of my favorites? Because what I heard the Lord say, and you can look at it in other versions, but the essence of this is he sees this angel standing there with his sword drawn, ready for battle. Joshua, they get ready to go in a fight. Are you for us? Or are you for them? And he said, I'm not for either one of you. I'm on the Lord's side. I, I represent the kingdom of God. I, I represent the army of God. In other words, God has an agenda and I represent his agenda. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to please them. I'm here to do what God called me to do. And that's an excellent example of what angels are called to do. They are not here just because uh, 
of what we want them to do, but they're here because of what God wants them to do. Okay. The, the commander of the army of the Lord, he doesn't give us his name, though we'll see in later scripture, and I'll tell you who I believe it probably would be, but we will see as we go along. Look at Daniel and look at chapter number eight. Verse number 16. I'm going to start at 15. Then it happened when I, Daniel had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, because Daniel had seen a vision of what was yet to come and was seeking the meaning. And that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice said between the, I heard, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ule who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. I want you to make note that the voice that spoke and told Gabriel to make plain to Daniel what it was that God was allowing him to see in his vision. Why is that important? Because whenever you see Gabriel's name, you know there's a message from God. Gabriel is the primary messenger all throughout scripture. He's the angel who God sent to tell people whatever his will was for their lives. We don't see cherubim missing, mentioned when you see a, a message being sent. You consistently see Gabriel. So that lets us know that Gabriel represents the voice of God, the, the will and the, the messenger of God, if you will. And we'll see that again in other places. Uh, and I love Gabriel. Well, we'll see as we go along. He don't play. Gabriel don't play. Look at, at uh, Daniel chapter number 10 and look at verse number 10. Now, again, Daniel saw another vision. And verse 10 says, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, oh, Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand stand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. In other words, as soon as you started praying, God heard your prayers from the very beginning. Don't be afraid, Daniel. God heard you, but let's keep reading. Verse 13, but, sent, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Remember, we talk about principalities that we have to war against. That means princes over territory. The prince over the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. So what does that tell us? Michael is what we call the warring angel. He, he is who I believe would have been the one speaking to Joshua. He said, I'm the commander of the army. The only alternative to that, and there's a debate, could be that it was Jesus himself. But in terms of angelic hosts, we see Michael, whenever there's a fight, when we get to Revelation, he's a warrior. He's the one that's going to be at battle. Gabriel's the one who's going to speak to you and tell you what God is saying. But it's Michael who's going to war on your behalf. If you're ever in a battle, call on Michael and ask him to bring his army with him and fight on your behalf. And so Michael Ward, but watch this, from the moment you open your mouth to pray, Daniel, we heard your prayer, God heard your prayer, and God sent me forward to answer, but I had to fight to get here, 21 days. Sometimes a delay might come, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't already dispatched the angels with the answer. Amen. And when we keep reading verse 14, now I've come to make you understand. I did read that, okay. Psalm 34. 
We're going to look at verse number seven. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So what does that tell me about who they are? They are our protectors. They are called to encamp around us and to deliver us out of trouble. That's why they sent, uh, God sent the angels when uh, Sodom was about to be destroyed to get Lot up out of there. They are our deliverers. They are there sent to move on behalf of God. Just like we are Christ's ambassadors now and God is pleading with the world to be reconciled to him through us. They are sent from heaven to perfect and to uh, protect us rather and to deliver us when we are in trouble. And we're going to see that various times throughout scripture. But they have been given an assignment to protect us, not just any old body. We're going to see that too. It is for those who will inherit eternal life. And so that's why you can walk with a certain amount of confidence because his angels are all around you, surrounding you, protecting you, delivering you. I believe I've encountered angels on a multitude of times. Uh, one of my adventures in uh, life was when I graduated law school and I went over to Europe and decided I was going to hang out. I had a classmate from law school who lived in Paris. So I went over there all by myself. <laughs> when you're young, you don't know no better. I went to Paris. I went to Zurich. I went to Frankfurt, Germany. I went to London. I traveled all over Rome, Venice. And I remember I was in Zurich, Switzerland, and I had one of those Eurail passes. So you could just jump on a train and travel all over Europe. And when I got to Zurich, I was going to take a midnight train and get to Rome the next morning. That was my itinerary. But somebody warned me, don't get on that train because they've been robbing people on the train. They said one lady was on there asleep. She had her money in her bosom. She woke up, it was gone. And you know, you got to be good <laughs> to steal the money out the bosom. But anyway, so I didn't get on the train. I end up, this is number God. I was stuck in Zurich, it's raining. And when I say raining, I mean, not just cats and dogs, it's raining horses and zebras, okay? It's pouring buckets. Every single hotel in the city was sold out. I'm like, Lord, I'm in Zurich. I don't know nobody in Zurich. I don't even have enough sense to, to be panicked. Again, when you're young, you just think, oh, God's gonna work it out, which he always does. By the grace of God, a lady, who was about my age, worked at the mall near the train station. We started talking. She ended up taking me home with her. And uh, I spent the night with her, got up and got an early train the next morning. Lord knows that lady had to get up early to go to work. But I got to the train station and I sat on that train. And I'll tell you, to this day, I believe it was an angel. He was an older gentleman. He was Italian. He didn't speak any English because I don't speak Italian. He watched over me all day. He bought me food. Uh, we probably had like an eight-hour train ride. And I remember these guys coming because it was that old-fashioned train where you had a sliding doors, you in a little cubby hole. If you ever seen coming to America, I'm not coming to America, uh, trading places, you remember they were in the train compartment. But anyway, he sat there with me. I remember these guys coming and looking in and they just kept it moving. I said, if I'd have been by myself, they'd have probably robbed me. He looked just like my dad. He had a Stetson on, he had a suit on. It was just like my dad would have had on. Only he was Italian. Same physical features, thin, tall, slim, all of that. It was like God sent him to watch over me. Of course, I never saw him again. My point is God will put people in your life, but he'll use angels. And you might not even know it. Look at Psalm uh, 91, very, very poor. Yes. Psalm 91 and 11 and 12. <clears throat> Psalm 91 and 11 and 12 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And of course, we know this to be uh, one, uh, what do we call a messianic message because that's exactly what they did with Jesus to protect them. But it also applies to us as his body. And God has sent his angels to watch over us, to keep us, to protect us 
and to bear us up. Look at Psalm 103, which reinforces what I just said. In verse number 20, bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. When you pray, you pray his word. Guess what? You activate the angels because they're called to do his word. That's why you don't need to just pray merely mouse prayers, but pray in accordance with God's will, his word. And that then gives the angels something to work with. What does it say? Heeding the voice of his word. Verse 21. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. So what's the point? Just like we saw in the scripture before, where they had to go in and take care of Lot, and we're seeing in multiple places, or all these things tell us they are charged to do God's pleasure, to do his will. So we want to walk in his will so that they can do what he's called, he's called them to do in our lives. Look at Matthew chapter 4. You remember when Jesus was tempted. In fact, the word of God said it was the Holy Spirit that led him into the wilderness to be tempted. That's a whole nother teaching. Then say he tempted because God never tempts anyone, but he led him in to be tempted. That's part of the perfecting that God allows us to go through as we are called to do his will. Verse 11 says, uh, this is, you know, the devil came and tested Jesus three times, you know, worship me, I'll give you this. You know, throw yourself off the side of the mountain, all that stuff. But he left after the devil, then the devil left him, and behold, what happened? Angels came and ministered to him. Those would be the cherubim. Their role was to minister to us. Look at chapter 22 and verse 30. Same book. Chapter 22. This is talking about the difference with us and angels. For in the resurrection, there is no more or given in mind, but I like the angels of God in heaven. In other words, angels are beings, but they won't be married. Uh, God didn't create them to intermarry. They're called uh, because they're spirit beings. So when we are uh, resurrected, we will have spiritual bodies as well. And we won't be married. You know, some people are like, you know, well, I know my husband. I'm not going to get into whether you know him or not. But according to this, you won't be married to anybody. Reverend Lady, we have a question. We'll deal with that at the end, sweet. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Who are they? What do they do? Look at Luke. Yeah, just keep track of them so you'll be ready when I'm ready. Luke chapter 1. And look at verse 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, but the angel, I'm going to go back to 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. But when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. This is Zacharias, who is the father of John the Baptist, and God uh, sent Gabriel, remember he's the messenger angel, to Zacharias to tell him about his son that was going to be born. Now that's the first cousin of Jesus. And it says, verse 12, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Now, mind you, Zacharias is old by now. Elizabeth has been barren. This is much like the story of Abraham and Sarah. They're old now. Who thinks they're going to have any kids? That lets me know they prayed a long time ago. He said, your prayer has been heard. What does that tell us? You should never believe because something didn't happen immediately that God didn't already hear you or that he won't answer you. Your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear your son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled 
with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. We know that when John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb, when Mary showed up pregnant with Jesus, John leapt in his mother's womb. He was filled with the Holy Ghost, even in his mother's womb. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So all of this is the message of the uh, Gabriel, the messenger who God has sent to give him what was going to happen. Uh, and then look at verse uh, 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced. He is, I'm old now. He don't tell me I'm having a kid. He said, how am I going to know that this is true? Verse 19. This used to bother me. Can I just side, give you this side note? Why? Because I said, God, the man had a legitimate question. Why are you taking out on him for asking a question? Let's keep reading. Verse 19. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, and who stands in the presence of God, and who was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be made mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words. Look, Gabriel's like, wait a minute, I'm Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. You dare question me? Oh, I got something for you. You won't be able to talk. And Zacharias could not speak again until his son was born. So I said, God, why did you do that? He had a legit question. I'm old. My wife is old. And you know what God reminded me of? He said he was not given a, a situation that hadn't been done already. Abraham did the same thing. Abraham saw that there is nothing too hard for me. So he should have known that when I sent Gabriel to speak, that he needs to listen. Now, Gabriel being who he is, Gabriel, like I said, Gabriel was not one to play with. When he spoke, he expected you to respect what he said because he stood in the very stands in the very presence of God. And so consequently, he said, you know what? You question me, guess what? You and I will ever be able to speak again until your son is born. What can we say? When the angel shows up, you want to be like Mary. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 26, speaking of Mary. Now in the sixth month, the, this is the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. For a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called a son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. So then Mary, verse 34, said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? So I said, OK, God. You made him be mute. Why didn't you take it out on Mary? Because Mary didn't have the same precedence. Who else had ever given birth to the son of God as a virgin? Okay, you got a legit point there, daddy. And the angels, verse 35, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her. Okay, so watch this. This is, the, this is the way God will have us to respond when we get a prophetic word. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In other words, God, whatever it is you want to happen, so be it. Your servant is available to do what you call me to do. But again, we see it's Gabriel that brings the word. It's Gabriel who is the messenger. Look at Luke chapter 2. Only got a few more minutes. And then we just have to pick up next week. I 
I came out here to rest my voice. Only because I love you are we here today. Now they were in the same country, was living on the field. Now fast forward, we moved from her being told she's gonna be pregnant to her now about to give birth to the son of God. Verse eight of chapter two of Luke. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign of you. You will find a babe wrapped in swollen clothes, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So that messenger would likely be Gabriel, because it says an angel gave that message to them. But then we see the glory of God being worshipped by multitudes. That will be the cherubim. Okay. John chapter 1, verse 51. All right. Says, and he said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God are sitting and descending upon the Son of Man. This is Jesus speaking when he was calling his disciples. And they were trying to figure out who he was. He's like, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to see the angels of God descending up in our city. So, again, they are called to do God's will and to protect and guide us. Look at Acts number, verse 1. I mean, chapter 1, 9. Let's see how we're doing on time. Acts 1, 9 through 11. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. This is Jesus about to ascend. Okay. Now, we. this is uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Oftentimes when we see uh, angels referenced, they're wearing white. They're wearing linen. Uh, they're wearing, um, or they're shining so brightly. Uh, in verse 11, those men in white who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come so come in like manner as you saw him going to heaven. So now these would be angels. Chapter five, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Uh, this is when the apostles were going out preaching and teaching the word of God. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those who with him came and called the council together with all the elders. In other words, because they had locked the apostles up for preaching and teaching the word of God, the angel was sent by God to set them free. They are deliverers. And then what we saw earlier in text, in the text, we'll do one more. Look at Acts chapter number 10. And look at verse three. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw Clearly in a vision, an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Now you can read more about him. He was uh, a what we would call a, a, a Gentile because he wasn't of Jewish descent. So remember, the word of God came first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. 
This is when God spread beyond the Jews to go to the Gentiles to give them the gospel, which we are if we were not born of Jewish natural descent. But spiritually, we are now Jewish because we've been grafted into the body of Christ. But in the natural, we would have been called Gentiles because we weren't born into that same lineage. In verse four, and when he observed them, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So here is an angel sent to Cornelius, who is a great man of God, who was happened to not be a Jew, but yet he got a word from the Lord sent by an angel. Verse five of chapter 12, Peter was therefore kept in prison. Again, these are uh, days when the early church was being birthed. God has allowed uh, different uh, attacks to come upon the church so that they would get out of Jerusalem because they were just having a good time. In Acts 2, they going house to house, breaking bread preaching, teaching, everybody getting saved who was right there, which was a beautiful thing. But God said, go into all the worlds and make disciples. They would have stayed in Jerusalem. We'd have never got the word or it took a long, much longer time, but God allowed them to be broken up, by uh, uh, allowing persecution to them. And then they took the gospel to get out of Jerusalem to live, they ran. But the good news is they took the word of God with them. And so many of us have come to know Jesus because they were run out uh, their comfort zone, so to speak. And that's what God will do. But let's look at verse five. Peter had gotten locked up. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, because they were going to crucify him, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So now he bound, locked up. That means they got him chained up against uh, soldiers, you know, not just good enough to stick you behind bars. We're going to change you to other soldiers to keep you from getting away. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison, which is not uncommon. Whenever an angel show up, you see a lot of radiance and light. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of his own accord. That speaks to the power of God operating through that angel. And he went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. So you see, God uses angels to deliver us. He uses angels to minister to us, to protect us. Okay. Now, I'm going to go with my time. So we're going to roll it down. I'll look at these last two just because. Luke 24, verse 1 through 5. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, this is after Jesus was crucified and put in a tomb, and certain other women, uh, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, again, Two men stood by them in shining garments, right? Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then they explained, go ahead. He's going to meet you like he said he would. These are presence of angels. How do we know? That light was shining. They were in white. Again, that radiance because they came to do God's will and to speak and, and uh, communicate what God was saying in that moment. Hebrews 13 and two says, do not forget to entertain strangers for by, do, by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So there are times when you will encounter an angel and don't even know it. They might look like a regular human being. 
that's why we should always be kind to everybody and entertain everybody and treat everybody well because you don't know who you may be dealing with. Amen. <clears throat> so I'll pick up right here next week. <clears throat> 